Yeah, yeah, good. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sorry that we did not make it the first time, but it appears that we're in better shape tonight. I wanted to be really upbeat. Uh, we have enough reasons to be concerned these days. And so this is hopefully a very upbeat presentation about something that many of us are very, very concerned about and love. And I just wanted you to have a wonderful evening tonight. So here we go. Simply Wonderful Our Loons. Uh, we're going to go through a few things tonight. What makes a loon a loon? Their evolution, their life cycle, their status in New Hampshire, threats, and Tin Mountains Loon Monitoring Program, which uh, many of you are participants in and for which uh, Rick Steber, your fearless leader, was uh, the original thought person about. He had this idea and uh, for for that we're all very grateful and i've had a lot of fun and appreciate the opportunity to have been helping out with this the picture by the way is a loon sitting on lower beach pond which is my pond in tufton borough the last time it nested here and notice how close that is to the edge of the water so what is a loon it's obviously a bird adapted for diving Look at the torpedo-shaped body there in that first uh, picture taken of a loon diving uh, right next to a kayak there. What wonderful long shape. And then look at that long dagger bill. It really is uh, amazing how strong and how long and sharp that bill is. You'll notice the feet are placed way back on the body. In this skeleton up in the upper left here, you can see how far back they are attached to the body. And in fact, part of the foot is within the body itself. And there are very strong muscles that they have. In the lower picture, you can see how the feet trail out the very back of the body and um, how they have that streamlined uh, body shape. They also here, this one shows how the feet are coming out the very back of the body and notice this particular loon is banded. Uh, not only does it have the US Fish and Wildlife bands, but it has colored bands on each leg and those colors are carefully noted and kept in records and so that's how we're able to identify individual loons later on um, once they uh, have been banded. And notice again the closeness of this uh, particular nest to the edge of the water. Now the evolution of loons is something that I was fascinated with and Bob and I, uh, when we began our bird watching, which was many years ago. I was eight years old when I got my first bird book, which is now almost beyond living memory. But uh, when I did, uh, Loons and Greaves were at the beginning of the book in the old Peterson guides. But Bob is now going to share with you quite a bit of information about uh, the evolution of Loons. So, Bob? Fine, thanks. Uh, the uh, first, I'm going to do two things here, really. Uh, first thing is I'm going to uh, trace the ancestry of the loons, how they evolved. And the second thing is I'm going to show you pictures of the five uh, uh, loon species now and their ranges. So I've got sort of a two-part thing. Uh, a thing that is not in this script that I want to add in here right now, though, is the amount of work Dana has been doing to do this. This uh, PowerPoint uh, has material in there, all 21st century uh, data that, has, that she's actually gone to the researchers and gotten. She spent hundreds of hours to put together something that looks very well. Well, let's start in the, uh, uh, the, oh, the first uh, few birds or uh, things that were like birds came out 65 million years ago. And, uh, and uh, we'll call it an ancient uh, loon uh, started uh, uh, to be in the oceans at one point uh, as they went along. I'm going to jump down to the last dot and mention that uh, they, that the loons weren't the only thing. There were several other 
uh, relatives of that that came along at the same time that, that weren't quite part of them. Uh, things like uh, tube noses, pelicans, penguins, shearwaters, uh, albatrosses, all those ocean birds of the southern hemisphere. The loon obviously is of the northern hemisphere. Okay, so now we're going down as we come through all of the uh, um, ancestors. Uh, not much was known about them. Oh, sure, there's fossils and so forth. They're dated by uh, a late 19th, 20th century thing uh, called uh, DNA uh, sequencing that measures the age of each of the things that they are looking at. So we're going to use that as that, and we're going to jump down here now to when the modern loon started to evolve. Think of a northern Pacific, let's say, and that's what it is. And the next picture will sort of show you what it, uh, how it works out. <clears throat> Uh, they learn uh, the loons are coming from left to right, as you can see. And uh, the first bird that uh, that the that evolved from this ancestral loon uh, is this thing that is right here on the extreme left. Uh, it's red-throated loon, and that was the first piece or the first bird, uh, species that evolved for now. Then the loon was happy with that, so they moved on and had a split, and they had two kinds of things working. And each one of those split into two parts. So let me take the top area here, uh, probably 30 million years ago, 25 million years ago. Uh, the top, top one uh, is the, uh, it's called Ema, but what it really is, is our, uh, our loon that we deal with now. And the one below it uh, is the uh, yellow billed loon, which looks very much like it. Some people think they both were evolved, uh, as it shows here. Uh, separately, and some people also feel uh, that it, that the uh, uh, yellow bill loon may have uh, been just been a northern relative of the uh, of our common loon. And down in the bottom here now, the other split that went on after they after they had the common loon here in North America and it spread all across the continent. Uh, then the next little problem that they had was to uh, work on another group. One of these is called the Arctic loon, uh, which uh, is uh, a little bit smaller than, the, uh, than our loons, but uh, an interesting bird. And uh, a, a, the alternate of that was the Pacific loon, named that because it's found along the Pacific coast of North America. Here's some pictures of them. We start with the red throat. You can see how red the throat is. These are all breeding bird uh, pictures. So some of the pictures we've taken ourselves up in the North Country, but basically they're that. But they have a sort of a gray head and a bright red thing. They don't look out like our common loon, but you can see on the map uh, that they uh, move along the red areas, which are the coast of North America in this map. And uh, they nest in the blue areas that are up really in the Northern uh, part of the continent. Here in, the world, here in the world view, uh, you have the yellow showing the same thing, and you can see they, uh, they're all across Asia into, uh, uh, they breed all across Asia into uh, the northern part of Europe, and then in the blue, they come down along the coast, but they're all northern hemisphere birds. None of them ever cross the equator and go south. The Arctic loon is another bird. Remember, that was the one in the uh, lower thing. Notice it's got a black throat. And a solid black throat, not the pattern of our common loon, but uh, quite a different pattern, almost like the red throated loon. You can see that in it. And uh, uh, the top picture we took off of Alaska, it doesn't a good picture. Well, we thought we'd throw it in because we've got some pretty good pictures. As we go on, uh, on the right, it shows where it breeds. And we were in those areas where the question marks were. Uh, and uh, it bred there, we believed, and we knew it blew, it was over in Siberia. But in the world view of the thing, you see, it goes from Siberia all across uh, Asia and, and, uh, and it's breeding also into Scandinavia. And then it moves in the summer down along the uh, China coast there and uh, through Europe. Pacific loon is quite like it. If you look at it, it's still got a gray head, those vertical white lines there and sort of a black throat. So you can see it, it is somewhat similar but it, it has an entirely different range. Uh, here it shows where it breeds, and it breeds, you can see in one picture, uh, all through Alaska, so it's easy to photograph up there. And it comes across to Hudson Bay. 
And uh, in this worldview of the thing, you can see it comes across even to the northern part of Labrador. And uh, what the, the reason I mention that is that is a very recent thing in the last half century or so it's been doing that. And that has led to a few of the birds turning off our Atlantic coast. We sometimes see it off of New Hampshire or Maine coast, sometimes as far south as Mass. The yellow bill loon now you see looks almost exactly like our bird. If I didn't mention yellow bill, you might not have noticed that it did have a yellow bill. It's actually a, a little bit larger than ours, but you see it's so much like a common loon that uh, some people feel that is just a northern relative because the map on the right shows it breeds north of Hudson Bay and it uh, comes, to, comes to the coast. And uh, worldwide, you see it's a just really on the Arctic Ocean and, uh, as you look at the thing. And so that's the reason that that, that is that. And uh, here are some pictures of it. It's a famous picture of our common loon here on the left. Uh, you can see, and you can see it has the uh, white banded collar uh, and, and uh, rather than the uh, all black throat, it's different in that regard. But otherwise, it's somewhat similar to uh, some of the other loons. And of course, as you notice it now, it breeds across North America in this map. And notice how far south it goes. It goes farther south than any of the others. It goes down into Mexico and almost to the Tropic of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And here's the, here's the worldview. It does get over into Europe, uh, not as a breeder, particularly, uh, unless you count the ones in Iceland, but basically it uh, is found along the European uh, Atlantic coast. Uh, and uh, so that, that is sort of the range of our bird and uh, a lot more about it. So now I'd like to share with you some of the distinct features of their life cycle. Uh, the adult moves move onto our lakes right after the ice is out in April, and some of them are banded. And I recall a story this spring where a loon was seen flying over a lake the day before the ice went out. So they are here, they come in on the lakes that are open or the rivers, and they are waiting for uh, this to happen, uh, this ice out. They seek a mate but they do not mate for life. Uh, that Some people had thought they might, but they do not mate for life. They feed mainly on bait fish. They love perch. They may be 20, 30 years old when they uh, are fully uh, their life cycle. They usually build the nest by June 5th, close to the shoreline, as you saw in some of those earlier pictures or on a raft, and we'll talk more about the work of rafting and, and ropes and signs later on. They brood usually two eggs, and each parent sits in four to six hour shifts as they are actually uh, able to uh, endure the heat or the black flies or whatever, but it's, um, and I recall on my lake watching at 6 a.m., it was every day, 6 a.m., there they were sh uh, shifting one from one to the other. The eggs usually hatch in about 27 days, typically around the 7th of July. And loons are very susceptible to lead poisoning from fishing gear, both sinkers and the lead-headed jigs. The adults will molt into their winter plumage in the fall. And the young will not fledge, actually leave their natal lake until they're 10 to 12 weeks old after the parents have left. Imagine they leave the lake without any guidance from their parent and they make their way over to the ocean. Uh, I know that Kitty Wilson, that wonderful loon enthusiast that lived on Pleasant Lake in New Hampshire, she actually found a lake that uh, a loon that had been banded um, on her lake on the ocean in Maine uh, by looking at those colored bands. Others go off the coast of Massachusetts, Rhode Island. That's where our loons usually go. The chicks and adults leave the freshwater lake in the fall, and as I said, they fly to the ocean. The chick spends three years on the ocean 
and finally returns to nest where it hatched. Uh, the chick is not sexually mature, although it may return as a four or five year old. Uh, usually they're six years old when they are actually first breeding. And uh, that means that you see a variety of uh, loons on a lake, some of which will be mature and some that won't. Now, as we said, they are a mated pair and there is no uh, worrying or second guessing if it is a mated pair. This is a beautiful picture by Mark Wilson and you can see how they are in sync with one another. Another pair of them swimming together. Um, and in the picture on the right, uh, Kim Infinger sent that to me. Her sister was in swimming and the mated pair actually swam right by. In fact, she said they were even closer before she got to take the picture. So they stay together, cooing, making soft little noises to one another as they um, make their way around a lake. Here's another mated pair. Now, eventually they get to build a nest. Now here's one where they just sort of have mounded it up on near the edge of a lake. Uh, they love islands. Uh, they do sometimes go on a raft. I know I put a raft out on my lake for four or five years and they totally ignored it. But this is the most beautiful nesting raft that I've ever seen. It was Kitty Wilson's um, raft that her husband built. Look at the blossoming tree that was able to exist because of the amount of soil they had placed on the raft and each year it was floated and in fact this year they had another two eggs but only one chick. And you can see this pair um, close to the edge of the water Two eggs, as we said, is usually the, the number that you see. Here, now, the young one has, the first one has hatched. There's usually a day or two between them. And the, when the fir, after the first one hatches, it will go back with the parent onto the nest while the parents are incubating that second egg. And then they will pop off the nest now and then to feed the little one. It's really quite a, a wonderful sight to see that first day or two of them. And they amazingly are waving their uh, legs, their wings. They uh, are become very active even at a young age. Look at this one. Don't you love that one with it? Um, waving its wings and stretching its legs on the back of the parent. I think that's the cutest picture. They often are floating on the back of the parent, uh, very happy sitting there. They're sometimes even the two of them are up there with their parents. Notice that red eye that the parent has. And notice the plumage of the first plumage of these young chicks. They're very downy and dark. Uh, they have this pl plumage for about four weeks. It's another one looking out. <laughs> Just so cute. And now this one is getting a bit bigger. It's losing some of that downy plumage. Notice the coloration on the neck of the parent. Blue and green is some iridescence. It's very rare that I've seen that coloration on it. You just have to catch it in the right light. Here, loons often do what we call leg waving. We're not sure exactly why. It may be a thermal regulating activity um, so that they're cooling off their uh, body and they wait while they wave the leg and that is a wonderful habit that they have and allows you to see uh, whether or not they're banded. The um, Loon Preservation Committee really bans a young one, certainly not very young ones, and um, so um, it, 
the bands will be seen by the in the adults. Now here, this chick is getting a little bit older. You can see its primaries coming in, those wing feathers. Remember, it's got to fly in a few weeks over to the ocean by itself. So it's got quite, this one has quite a ways to go. Here they are, a pair of them getting older. In This is the plumage now that they will hold on to for 26 months, this first plumage. So you can see in this picture, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and 11 weeks. And notice the very scalloped edges of the young here. And as I said, they will hold this plumage until they leave, go to the ocean, and they'll be 26 months old before they molt again. And I read a posting on the main bird column the other day where someone had seen an immature loon on the ocean and wondered what that bird was, what a laggard it was, why it hadn't changed its plumage. Here is one of these older, uh, young with that scallop plumage, still with its adult, trying to swallow that fish. Notice the red gills on that fish. I just figured out what they were. <laughs> right. uh, loons, because their legs are placed so far back on the body, have to go to a great deal of effort, need quite a running uh, space in order to get themselves lifted out of the water and they whip along there uh, for quite a while before they can become airborne. Here is this uh, sometimes what they call the penguin posture. The loon sometimes will be doing this just to uh, move its wings, but it also can assume this posture more in an aggressive period when they may be interacting with another uh, intruder. Uh, there are a lot of rogue loons, additional loons on a lake, and those young, particularly the young males that are there, are always looking to be able to take over the territory from the nesting loon on that lake. And I recall I went out with the Loon Preservation Committee uh, banding loons one night on Squam Lake. That was a Tuesday night, and on uh, we banded this male loon and put it back with its chicks. I held one of the chicks while we were uh, waiting for them to finish the banding, and they put the chick and the parent back in the lake, and the next day that bird interacted with an intruder. It was seemingly very weak and the bird was driven up on the shoreline. The Loon Preservation Committee tried to catch it, but it couldn't get it, and it died on Friday. And it had been impacted by lead fishing gear, and so that's why it was weakened, and that's why it was able to be uh, actually killed by the intruding loon. And the intruding loon not only killed that ailing male, but it also killed the chick. So they can be very aggressive when they're looking to take over a territory. Here is another good picture of showing the bands, how distinctive they are. So if you ever watch a loon waving its leg, look carefully. Uh, often a picture will help and you can look back at it, blow it up, and see the color combination and let the Loon Preservation Committee know and they can tell you when and where that loon was banded. Here they are, um, biologists from the Loon Preservation Committee actually banding loons. And they are putting the band on on the right side of the um, picture here. He's putting the band on here while the loon is being held, and its head is usually wrapped in a towel to keep that bill um, secure and not able to be a lethal weapon. And here, uh, this woman is working on a second loon over here. 
They do usually like six inch perch. That's their favorite food, but they've been known to um, eat larger fish. This was actually taken of, of a trout on Silver Lake. And I know at the Loon Preservation Committee, they have a, a loon a, the stuff that had such a large bass in it that it, it the bass got caught in its throat and the bird actually died. And so they now have the bass mounted and the loon mounted and you can see this poor loon with uh, the fate that it uh, befell it. Here is the adult loon. As fall progresses, they begin to lose that speckled uh, black and white plumage. And they uh, particularly, they start around the face. Looks like they're getting to be an old man here, but this is where the molting starts and they molt their body feathers um, and they look very different as they actually are uh, going over to the ocean. So they have a plumage of their body, um, a molt of their body feathers before they leave for the ocean. But just to step back for a minute, I recall there was a year when the ice was very late to come in on the lakes and there were some loons that were out on Winnipesaukee that hadn't left in January and the Loon Preservation Committee somehow got out, out there and found out that the reason the loons hadn't left was they had stayed on the lake so long because it hadn't frozen that their winter wing feather molt occurred and they couldn't fly. So if the Loon Preservation Committee hadn't gotten there and actually caught them, they would have died. But let's look at the threats that loons face here in New Hampshire. Certainly lead fishing tackle is number one. Monofilament line is another one. Climate change, weather, black flies, human interference, both development and harassment, eagles, mammalian predation, water level changes. They can flood or drought and I know Johanna was uh, documenting a loon on Duncan Lake that really uh, had a serious problem during the drought a couple of weeks ago trying to get to its nest and we're not sure whether it eventually just abandoned the nest but the eggs were gone and there was no uh, continuation of that. There are also oil spills, chemical contaminants. Here is a graph prepared by the LPC, the Loon Preservation Committee, showing that lead tackle is clearly, that in red, is clearly the biggest uh, threat that loons have. Other lead, um, maybe 4%. So that's 46%. That's almost half the, the loon deaths are caused by lead. A monofilament line, uh, which is amazing how that can be easily, a uh, loon can be entangled by that. Uh, lines break and the loon catches a fish, the, the line in the, uh, is still attached and it ends up uh, actually causing the loon a great deal of problem. Boat collisions, gunshots, there's even an avian malaria that they've now found uh, various trauma, not always sure what uh, it may be being struck by a boat. Um, and various loon trauma problems, this uh, disease uh, and other and unknowns. We have a large unknown um, segment there. Of, we don't know exactly what actually was the cause of that. Here is an x-ray and here in the lower center portion of the uh, loon, you can see this was actually the lead uh, sinker or lead headed jig that this loon ingested. And in two weeks, the loon is often dead. Just two weeks. And it goes into their gizzard and the gizzards of birds are designed to 
grind up food that they have eaten. Uh, but in this case, if they get a lead bearing product in their gizzard, they just grind and grind away at the uh, actual lead and actually it then disperses further into their system, which is tragic. Here is a picture showing this poor loon entangled by monofilament line. Uh, weather is a big issue these days in climate change as the weather warms is going to be quite an issue for those loons that are nesting out in their, on their own in the wild. There's no protection usually from the sun and this loon is panting. Um, and often they get so hot they abandon the nest and um, then you could have predation or humans work coming in and um, actually destroying the eggs. Here's another uh, nest and loon predation. Uh, this is black flies. There is a species of black fly that is specific to loons and they attack the adult loon as it sits on the nest, just driving it crazy. And eventually it may just leave the nest. And that's of course earlier in the fall, I'm sorry, in the spring. And at that point it may be cool. The eggs could actually um, be affected by uh, being left and getting cold. You find shoreline development. I find this picture that uh, John Cooley gave me and showed. Here is this loon nesting with a dock and these chairs. This bird was absolutely determined to nest on this shoreline with all these people and all this activity. And this uh, is one of Levitt Bay, this picture on the right, showing the amount of development. The poor loon has nowhere that it can nest. It is this year um, not on the shoreline, but it did um, set up on this little island out in the bay. I'm not sure whether it's still um, being uh, able to uh, raise young, but um, that's it. There is also, of course, aggression as we spoke earlier about the adult loon, uh, particularly the younger male uh, often, either during the uh, period of time when it's trying to uh, secure a mate or later on, there's a great deal of interaction between loons, males, usually the males, and uh, they will swim, they will scurry across the water, They'll rise up in that penguin-like position and um, they can be quite uh, effective in hurting, uh, causing pain to the other. In fact, when they've looked at some of the skeletons of loons, you can actually see how the sternum has been uh, impacted by loons pecking uh, at each other. And this is a famous picture of an eagle that was harassing this loon. And this loon obviously has come out of the water and is because it is trying to prevent this eagle from uh, harassing it. Uh, over on the right, this is a dead eagle. There was a loon last year that um, actually was being harassed by an eagle. It had a young chick and the loon actually pierced the chest uh, th right through the bone, chest bone of the eagle and killed the eagle. But the eagle had already killed that loon's baby. So um, that was the first time that had ever been documented. You see also uh, when the water gets lower, the nest is way up in the upper portion of this picture there and because the legs of the loon are so far back in the body they do not walk on land they just sort of lump along 
on their chest, they pre press with their feet and then fall on their chest and try and move, not very successfully often. And so um, in a period like the drought or when in some of our lakes where the dam managers are not maintaining the level of the water at a consistent level during the uh, during rainy periods, um, the loon's nest can be affected. 12 inches of water will drown a loon's nest and six inches of lake drop will often cause them to abandon it. So that is a real crucial factor. Uh, the Loon Preservation Committee located in Moultonboro is really a crucial organization helping to ensure that loons survive, prosper, and increase. They play some key roles. Uh, they have a management role where they're monitoring. They hire biologists from around the country to actually go and to um, monitor um, the uh, nesting of loons. They rescue loons that have been hurt or um, either by a boat or a lead or that fishing line. Uh, they build, help build signs and put out rafts. They advocate for good practices to protect loons. They're doing a lot of research on climate change, on um, the impacts of various pollutants, and they are very um, doing a great deal of education to educate people. Here is the status of loons in New Hampshire as of last year. We're going to go through different parts of the state and uh, the number of pairs that were there last year. Now, the Lakes region is our region. These are regions that the Loon Preservation Committee have created. And so down in Monadnock, they had 34 pairs. And up in the North Country, they had 54. And uh, down in the Seacoast, 56. 42 pairs in the Sunapee area, 13 pairs on Squam. Umbagog has 14, Winnie Winnipesaukee has 29. And you all know our Lakes Region biologist this year, James Longo, and because he used to work at Tin Mountain. So um, we're very fortunate this year to have our biologist be someone who's so familiar with Tin Mountain and with our part of the uh, state. This is a graph prepared by the Loon Preservation Committee showing that when they started in 1975, the number of loons, uh, the red line is paired adults and look where we are now in 2019. So through their management and research advocacy, uh, protection, education, they've helped to um, ensure that the loons population in the state has increased significantly. We're still not up to the green line, which is where they think is the carrying capacity for the state. Um, looking at the number of lakes that still don't have uh, loons. And uh, there is even a higher level that could possibly do it. So this graph does show some wonderful progress, but that we all certainly have a lot more to do. And here is the loon chick surviving per territorial pair. The red line is the number that we need in order to have and stabilize the population in the state. If it drops below that 4.8, I think it is, um, if we don't have that many young, we're not able to continue to grow and replace loons as they older get older and um, are unable to uh, produce chicks. So you can see that there are often weather events or significant difference from year to year in the number of uh, surviving chicks per territorial pair. So we're, it's still a struggle. We have got to keep uh, also not only um, seeing that we have mated pair, but also that 
somehow those chicks can survive. This is a monitoring overview by year showing that the number of lakes that were monitored where they had the presence of loon in the dark uh, part of the bar and that they actually were monitoring a greater number of lakes seeing if there is uh, that the loons have moved on to them. This is the uh, statistics for last year. Uh, the Loon Preservation Committee surveyed 334 lakes with, uh, in some lakes like Winnipesaukee, Squam, even Conway Lake have more than one territory. Uh, there were 330 13 territorial pairs, but look at that number of 113 unpaired adults. About one quarter of the adults did not actually um, pair up, uh, and one third of them were nesting. Uh, one third of those uh, obviously um, did not nest. The, you can see the number of chicks that we had and the number of chicks uh, that hatched and number that survived into mid-August. So we were just at that level where we could have enough survival um, to maintain a steady population. Um, the Tin Mountain Moon Monitoring Program is just wonderful. I think I'm probably prejudiced, but I think it is. There are 18 Tin Mountain monitoring uh, folk. Uh, they're monitoring 18 lakes. To date, we have had six lakes with nests and we've had lakes where the uh, eggs have hatched. I think it's three lakes now. Um, Duncan did have a nest, but they're re-nesting. Re Five lakes have a mated pair that have not nested. So that may be the one third uh, that aren't actually nesting. I know people have been watching carefully on the Kimballs, on Iona, Mountain Pond, and Big Peak because they still have a mated pair. And there are seven lakes within our 18 that have the potential for a successful pair. Um, most of, um, and so we're continually monitoring those to see if indeed there are enough loons to move on to these additional lakes. This is where the ponds are that the loon um, that the loon monitors from Tin Mountain are actually um, looking for loons. So we have quite a few from Mountain Pond and Sawyer Pond in the north, way down to Duncan Lake, which is at the junction of 16 and 28. Uh, down in Ossipee. And uh, some of these have nesting loons, obviously some don't, but it's quite a large territory. I'm sorry, the lines don't show as uh, well as they could in terms of where the ponds are. But um, that gives you a feeling for the range of the lakes that the Tin Mountain folks are monitoring. In closing, we hope that you, you've enjoyed this talk and that about our simply wonderful loons. And um, feel free to contact uh, us or the Loon Preservation Committee, uh, Katie Lewis at Tin Mountain is also helping a great deal uh, organize the Tin Mountain volunteers. And it's wonderful to have her on staff and have her be able to um, help out with uh, helping to organize all of these individual people. So with that, uh, we're happy to um, entertain any questions that you might have. Feel free also to give us feedback. Um, if there's something that we could improve or change or that you liked or didn't like about the, this talk, please just happy to know how to make it better. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Nora. Nora? Yes, yep. Good, I am good. Here. All right. Here. Sorry. Good. Um, yeah. and I'm going to actually, um, if you want to stop your screen share, then we'll go back to. Um, I should just close this down. Go 
So. You can close that down, but at the top. Okay, my okay. assistant is going to help me here. Good. Sorry. No problem. Good. But thank you so much for that. Um, and as I oh. said, so um, if folks have questions, um, the two ways to go about it are um, you can type in anything right into the, the chat box and I can read it out or you can um, just unclick, um, you know, unmute yourself and you can ask them. And I actually, um, I'm going to start off with a question that I have for you, Dana, because this is something that we encountered um, on a lake just over the border um, in Western Maine recently, is that um, one of these nesting rafts had uh, recently appeared, but it was, it appeared to be made out of um, you know, what I would describe as orange pool noodles. Um, and just um, if there is any, um, and it was also, I should say, it was not in use, but um, I'm just curious about, um, you know, sort of what the guidelines are and suggestions um, and any, you know, and even restrictions in terms of constructing and placing um, these nesting rafts. I think the way I would respond to that, and I think Carolyn Hughes is uh, one of the observers, and uh, feel free um, if there are any other LPC people uh, to step in. Um, John Cooley has a design, and he often has had a group of people I know that um, Bill Petrie has gone down and helped with the construction of the raft. So John has a design and um, I am not sure whether the um, state of Maine or the New Hampshire Audubon, uh, I'm sorry, the Maine Audubon, both of which are active with loon activities, have a design that they are recommending in Maine, but there is such a thing as a design. And I know that also in um, New Hampshire, Carolyn Hughes has been experimenting with the arch of cloth. You could see that it was a fabric that was um, sort of cut out. So it, 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 we feel that that may be very important to help per, um, keep the loon cooler in these hot, hot, in increasing warmer times due to climate change, because um, if it's sitting right out in the open, it is the loons What's do up, get. So I think that um, there is a design, and I think that, um, but it is not orange noodles. Um, but is there, and I don't know if anyone else, you know, and if anyone else on, you know, this conversation, James, I can see you're there, even if your camera is off, um, that um, are there any restrictions? I mean, could anyone find these plans, create a raft and put it the, out or do you the loon have preservation to committee, with... Right. The Loom Preservation Committee feels that you, it is best for the loon to nest on its own, and they only put them in when there are conditions uh, so that it should be something in New Hampshire that a person works with the Loon <laughs> Preservation Committee. I know that I thought that there wasn't much uh, natural habitat on my lake, and for a few years, John Cooley was kind enough to uh, bring a raft over to my lake and we tried it, but they didn't use it. So they don't always use it if even if there is one. But uh, the Loom Preservation Committee is making the decision in New Hampshire. And um, I am not sure about Maine. I know that the state of Vermont is very active with a group of volunteers so uh, monitoring their loons and so I assume that they are working in conjunction with the volunteers to first decide whether it's a good idea and then where to place it and of course they usually are taken out during the winter so someone has to take them out and store them for the winter and then um, put them back up in the spring and you take down the the um, 
uh, cloth that you pull out the the poles that hold the cloth uh, during the winter so that's flat and you may put new nesting material on the uh, platform so that it's more attractive to the loom. I have a question. Um, as far as I know, there is a um, annual census on the 18th. And um, I don't know if, if anybody else knows about it in this group and if Carolyn wants to talk about that. Yeah, I'd love to give a, a plug for the census. Um, so for those who aren't aware of what it is, the Loon Census is an annual event and it's, we hold it, we host it in New Hampshire, but also people are out doing this in Maine and New York and Vermont. Uh, and the goal of it is to get as many people out on as many lakes as, at the same time as possible so that we can get sort of a snapshot of Loon activity um, at that one point in time. And so a lot of the times the census might help us turn up a nest that we didn't know existed or a chick that we didn't know had hatched yet. Um, or, you know, a pair of adults that maybe we had seen on one of our three surveys, but we weren't sure was a resident pair on a particular lake. So it's a really valuable part of our annual loon monitoring. Um, and so if anyone is watching that would like to participate, it's, it's occurring on July 18th from 8 to 9 a.m. And you could send me an email and I'll put my email address up in the, the chat so that you know how to get in touch with me. Um, and I can let you know which lakes we don't have coverage on yet so that, uh, you know, maybe you can go out and do the survey on that lake. I just want to add that Chris, uh, that Carolyn and John Cooley have been extremely helpful in providing me with some additional pictures and information and they're always being asked questions by me and they're just a wonderful resource. I really can't be more appreciative for their help. And I do know that um, great uh, cheers to Johanna and to a new uh, loon monitor um, who was looking at Crystal Lake and Hatch Lake at the same time because there'd been questions from the Loon Preservation Committee about whether the loons were moving back and forth in those lakes. And so uh, Joanna and Laurel went out there uh, at the same time and were in con communication by cell phone so they could report exactly um, where and if there were loons on either of those lakes. And now that pair um, is going back and forth during the day to Crystal, but they are nesting on Hatch. So cheers to Johanna and to um, <laughs> Laurel for helping to monitor that. And I know that Henry Nekamara now, who has a place on Hatch, has also been watching. And um, there's been a lot of valuable information that the loon monitors are providing, and I'm really grateful. And some of them, even like Rick, hike miles into Mountain Pond in order to actually check that pond that you can only get to by a long hike. And um, it's, it's amazing what dedication and um, the amount of effort that these volunteers are going to. So cheers to them. Hey, Dana. Look, just to be clear, the road was closed for a couple of years. So I rode my bike in. That was the easy way to go. The road is now open. It's no longer a hike. I just want to be clear. Thank All you. right. Okay. <laughs> Still three cheers, Rick. <laughs> Hi, Dana. It's always fun. It's always fun. <laughs> you spend time on Keenan Street Lake, which is over in, in the western part of the state. And this last weekend, we saw two pair, two adult plumage, two pairs of adult plumage birds. So would they be uh, siblings that came back to hang with their parents or just two separate pairs? Or what do you think? They seem to hang together a lot. Well, if the two, two hung together and then the other two hung together, right? Well, they, they actually were together, the four of them, a fair amount of time. Okay. If they were all in adult plumage, um, they could have been. Um, 
and if you didn't see any bands on them, you wouldn't, and what pond was that again, please? It's Canaan Street Lake, which is in Canaan, which is just the side of Lebanon. Okay, Canaan, okay. That's part of the state. Uh, Carolyn, um, or uh, I don't know whether that's one of your um, lakes, James, but um, feel, feel free to fill in afterwards. But uh, there can't, how big is the lake? Do you know how many acres? Yeah, 300 acres. It's a small lake. Okay, well, they usually say that 80 acres is about the amount that a pair need so that lake could obviously sustain more than one pair um there would have to be suitable habitat there uh, but if they were sort of hanging out together but weren't aggressive towards one another they may not any of them may none of them may have had a nest there they might have been more um uh, protective of their uh, particular habitat on the lake had they had a nest um, and um, they won't be the young won't come back obviously for you know till they're four or five years old and the six years old is when they're usually mature so they could not they could possibly be still immature there but the the only way we know for sure is whether they were banded. I mean, that's because they look alike there. And, um, but watching them, you know, if you are able to observe more about that, uh, feed any of your observations into the Loon Preservation Committee, they'd really appreciate it. Yeah, okay, will do. Thank you. I put it on eBird, but I, I'll start doing that as well. Good, thanks. Hey, Dana, uh, I had a question about. It's always amazed me that the adults leave and and the newly hatched, uh, you know, the fledglings, uh, with a lot of bird species actually, but in particular loons. So they're left on their own and, and they they do know where to go, obviously. Yeah. But is, is there any is there any reasoning or, or thought on on why, you know, why uh, in the way that things have developed is that has that scenario been created? I, I'm just always puzzled by that. I don't know, Rick. I I don't. Um, I, I find it amazing as well. I don't. There are some birds that fly in flocks. We know that, you know, so that there are some that do travel together. But um, it is extraordinary, and they they clearly have been able to do it so that evolutionarily, this is now something that is within their genes, their their system that oh, they yeah. can do. So they aren't dependent upon the adults to in effect show them the way. Yeah. Dana, I had a question. Do you say they don't mate for life? So right. they have a different partner the next mating season? Possibly, sometimes it will be the same. But, okay, so uh, does the, the female always return to the same nesting pond as she did the previous year? They usually come back to, and even the young come back to within 10 miles of where they were born usually there. But um, we don't know as much. We're still learning a lot about loons. I know I was talking to Harry Vogel, the head of the Loon Preservation Committee, about molts because um, what do those young loons, you know, they, they don't molt until the first molt they have after they leave their lake is 26 months later. So they haven't, they don't come back anywhere near the first sum, uh, summer and they don't mate till probably after the nesting season. Right. And then the third season, it appears that they get a bit more adult-like, but um, I don't know whether they lo lose their uh, primaries so they can't fly in January like the adults do. There's still a lot that we're learning. And um, I know that some pairs will, um, come back and be on the same lake and we know that because they're banded like the late the loons on pleasant lake are banded 
so they know that they come back. But eventually, one younger male will try and step in, and he may be successful in beating out the old male. So eventually, you know, the males or the females are re uh, replaced by more aggressive young birds. And, you know, Carolyn, James, anytime I misspeak, I know you'll be there to please let me know. Uh, Dana, uh, greetings to you and Bob and uh, Charlie. Um, some questions, uh, but first I will, I will verify that Rick does, did ride his bike down. I was hiking up Town Hall <laughs> Road and all of a sudden this rocket comes by on a, on a bicycle. Uh, <laughs> But he did stop and we chatted a little bit. So he, he does, he did do that. That is absolute true story. Um, so let me just give you three questions and I'll listen. Um, first, when you talked about the uh, aggressive young male that, that killed the um, one poisoned by lead, did, do you think it sensed that the, uh, that adult male was weakened and therefore went after it? Second is Mountain Pond, uh, not Mountain Pond, um, Soya Pond wasn't mentioned as being monitored, and I know there had been uh, loons up there. And third, uh, I was recently over with friends and on a ride. There's a small island in Lovewell Pond, Lovell, Lovewell Pond in Maine, Freiburg, which is really part of the valley. But does LPC just concentrate on New Hampshire uh, and not monitor it? So anyway, okay. it, it, LPC is just New Hampshire, but there are uh, the um, Maine Audubon is trying to um, monitor the southern lakes and they have a uh, a day like the LPC does where they encourage people to go out and actually do a survey. The Biological Research Institute, BRI they call it, is actually monitoring a lot of the northern lakes in Maine. Now that uh, instance of the loon uh, on Squam that died, I am sure that he saw that the loon was um, weakened because that, you know, he died on the Friday. Uh, he had that interaction with the other loon, but he, it was clearly the lead that, that was the cause of, main cause of his death there. And um, those unmated, you know, young Turks uh, that are out there are watching for signs like that, I think, in, in that particular instance. And there was a second, a middle question, Charlie. Un, I'm going to get unmuted here. Yes, um, Mountain, uh, not Mountain Pond, um, Sawyer Pond had- Oh, sorry, sorry, the, John? John and Cheryl Keeter are yeah, monitoring the, that. The Keeters are still doing that. Okay. Right. And we have not found any nesting there. They periodically see a loon there, and but we haven't. In fact, um, loons, the the loons on Hatch is a very small pond, um, just south of Crystal and north of Purity, and it probably isn't big enough so to sustain a pair because i think it's only 19 acres but if it goes up to crystal it can get additional um food so that's probably why they're moving back and forth and i know we have had a loon this year um that we see part of most days and it's either an unmated loon or it's one that um and it definitely is leaving the lake, at, you know, after a period of hours. So uh, it is um, feeding or uh, has a nest somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dana, my daughter who is watching the, the watch the presentation here with me had a question um, and it gets sort of, dovetails with what Charlie was saying, but in situations where um, there are a pair of loons and, you know, a male drives off and drives another off a territory, will that loon then take the yeah. mate or, um, you know, or do the, do the pair tend to stay together? 
the if it is in my understanding when um the new male comes in he will uh bond with that female probably not nest that year but he will mm -hmm. be there and will tr try and um stay with that loon for you know a, a period of time the rest of that summer he may even end up uh being its mate the next year but um often when loons are old and and they are still productive for you know i think carolyn um actually found a 26 year old male loon the other day over on that lo level lake and um it she knew how old it was because it had been banded but the older males are um sometimes killed or they're sometimes um actually just um pushed out and um the the new male will stay with that female and try and he's really trying to establish himself with that territory mm -hmm. it's sort of a, a geographic thing that he's trying to maintain this is you know my house my my yard my my garden my mayan there mm -hmm. so that is um what he is uh attempting to do so that he will then be the uh possessor because he usually comes in first when they come back in the spring and um, so he's waiting for her when she returns. Okay, thank you. All right, do we have any other questions um, from folks? I know Dana put her contact information in there and we certainly at Tin Mountain know how to get a hold of <laughs> Dana and James and, uh, and other folks, but um, if there aren't any questions, um, just thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad that you are not floating on a boat right now out in front of your your neighbor's house. But I'm also very glad that you know that we were able to make it work in uh, in this second attempt. Well, thank you ever so much, Nora. You've been so great to work with. Bravo! <laughs> thank you. Thank and you. thanks to Carolyn and John and everyone who helped. And um, thanks to all the good work of the Tin Mountain Monitors. You're really Thank great. You. Thanks, Dana. Great job. Thank Wonderful. You. Yeah. It's amazing Hi, what you can Dana. learn. <laughs> Hi, Tom. How are you? 